see a lot of things, not just money. So we're going to start in 1 Timothy 6 today. Um, and I want to read a passage. I'm probably, I'm just going to kind of sit on this passage. I have a few other things to share along the way, but um, I've listened to a few, uh, I would say podcasts, uh, the last few weeks. And one of them really struck me. It was talking about addiction. Um, a lot of times, uh, addiction comes from a, a hole, a pain, a trauma, um, a fear that you have that causes you to, to, your body, your mind, you do things that you're trying to take care of that need that you have, and you don't have a, your, your body and your mind don't have a great way of solving the problem. And so it, it shows up in the form of, um, I can't stop drinking, uh, even though I know it's bad for me uh, to get out of control, or I can't, uh, I can't stop gambling, even though I'm probably not going to win because the odds are definitely not in my favor, or I'm, I'm looking at pornography thinking that gives me some sense of um, control or ego boost or whatever the thing is, or I can't, I, the, the, one of the things that I listened to um, was a person who was a performer, and they just love the applause and the accolades and the seeing people in public, and they're like, oh, wow, you're that person. Um, and they just, it was just a huge thing for them. Um, and one of the things that they talked about in that specific podcast was being comfortable with identifying the need that you have, but then finding the healthy ways to meet that need. Because there's nothing, God made us with needs. I mean, it, it, Brandy just said it up here. He made us enough, but we are not all the same. We're not robots that are all exactly, we're not clones. Uh, we're not clones of Jesus Christ the, the fle in, in the flesh. Um, spiritually, you could say we're clones, but each one of us looks different. We act different. We have different needs. We have different personalities and these things. So we have to learn to be comfortable with who we are. I'm glad Brandy said that. And then, of course, we sang that song, uh, Pat Barrett, the This is the Kingdom. Jesus explained that in Matthew 5, 6, 7. Um, we have to be comfortable with knowing who we are, and then we've got to find those connections between who God is in us, Christ in us, uh, the hope of glory, so that we can be Christ to the world with who Chris is, with who Judy is, with who Daryl is, with who Tina is, because he gave us those abilities and talents and needs, all the things, um, and he made us to be successful, and he gave, he gave us solutions to our problems. So uh, one, the thing I was mentioning about addictions is that addictions are not necessarily just evil, wrong, sin, you know, you're going to go to hell if you have an addiction. It should be pointing you to something that you need to deal with in a more healthy way, because the dealing it with it in the way that's publicly destructive obviously is not the best way. It's not going to work long term. Um, and it was, it was pretty helpful to see that, because it used to be if you were addicted to anything, you probably got a demon, and <laughs> you've you're got a serious problem with sin, and you need to overcome this by just cold turkey quit or go to rehab or whatever um, and the guy that was talking in that in that video was talking about what they did to him in rehab that actually helped him see the problem so anyway, Alcoholics Anonymous actually has quite a reasonable approach uh, when they tell you there's things you can't control but you have to control the things you do control things you have control of first Timothy 6 verse 3 uh, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men and depraved, of depraved mind and depraved, deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. I'm going to pause there. This passage is starting out, and he's talking about religious scholars, theologians, philosophers that think they have a better solution than what the gospel message is. They, they think because of experience or culture or tradition or some great wisdom of the world, they think they have a better way to approach this than just Christ and Christ crucified. And of course, we know Paul was a Christ and Christ crucified only. That's it. That's the only way. So th that's, that's how this passage starts out. But let's keep going and look at what it kind of leads into. Verse 6, But godliness 
actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Accompanied is a very important word. Godliness is here. Contentment is here. These are two things. He's saying when they're accompanied, it is great gain. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. I might as well keep going. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you were made, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So the the important thing here, and of course, we're talking about contentment. But it goes into a whole passage where you're talking about don't chase money for the love of money. Like, don't, it's, not, it's not helpful, it's not healthy, and it is not going to solve all your problems. So I've read a few books. I'm going to end up getting, getting back to uh, where I started. But I've, I've read a few books, and uh, two are called Breaking the Spirit of Poverty, and one is called, uh, what's it called? Free to Give. I, I wrote it down. I didn't write it down. Power, power to give or, or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting it. But I looked at the similarities that they have and the way we take on nature of generous, uh, God's generosity, go away from the nature of spirit of poverty, go away from the spirit of, of brokenness, the nature of, of brokenness and not enough. And there were several similarities in these books. Uh, one was written in 1988, um, and I wrote down things from a chapter. I'll, I'll just tell them to you. My little, my little highlights didn't work. Um, in 1988, Ed Montgomery said, these are road signs of poverty. One, refusing instruction. Two, following vain persons. Three, withholding more than you need. Four, get-rich-quick motivation. Five, neglecting the materials, material needs of the work of God. Six, disunity, and he's specifically talking about being a loner, thinking you don't need anybody. And seven, laziness. In Mark Pfeiffer's book, 2006, he has, uh, in chapter three, he has 10 biblical principles for increase, where God's will for us is increase. Not everybody's going to be a millionaire, but we are not, we're not destined to just be bound in poverty. There is opportunities for us to increase, to have enough, more than enough, to be able to help other people. And that comes in a lot of different ways. So I'm not, again, I'm not saying everybody's going to be a millionaire because I don't think that's scriptural. Uh, he says the ten biblical principles for increase. One, be generous. Two, use, now, just, just to mention, be generous sounds, it sounds opposite of increase. Because when you are generous and you give money away, that decreases your bank account. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that that's a spiritual principle of increase. But he's, he, and he explains it, of course, and we all know this, lots of scriptures that tell us that giving is actually increase. <clears throat> but he says, be generous. Number two, use wisdom and spending. This is that uh, wise as a fox, you know, smart, uh, shrewd businessman. This is, you, you can't just, just spend on everything you want. You, I, your eyes, you know, just like a kid, when they get a plate full of food of that thing that they really had to have and they don't eat half of it, you, you can't do that in life. You can't want more than you actually have money to, to buy. And if you don't save and you don't give and you don't do things that are important that aren't necessarily good, good feelings right now, right this second, uh, satis instant gratification, then you're not going to have the things that you really want. That's I mean, just straight. Use wisdom and spending, work hard, be productive, invest in yourself, network relationships, hang out with successful people, keep your eyes focused forward, create a plan and have a strategy, don't be afraid to take risks, and his tenth is start now. Don't, don't wait someday, maybe, this may work out when I get to a certain point. And then in this uh, 
free to give. It is, that is the author, or that is the name of the book. Uh, and um, Josh at Cornerstone or Hill City. Is that his name? Corey Rice. Corey Rice, thank you. Uh, he actually writes the introduction to this book. Uh, so I just bought it recently. It's a 2023 book, well, 22, because I bought it last year. Uh, Paul Young is one of the writers in there. There's 13 authors. And in chapter 6, he has five suggestions for growing in generosity. We cannot be free to give unless we are free not to give. So it can't be a legal thing. We must be free to receive before we can be free to give. Uh, Paul, or even uh, Mark Pfeiffer talks about in his book that if you can't receive compliments and just say thank you and just be be gracious in your response to people's gifts to you and their compliments to you and the things they give you, it means that you don't actually put value on other people above yourself. That, and and that is, that's poverty. If you think that you can do it all, you don't need anybody, I'm, I got this, I don't need your compliments, I don't need your gift, I don't need, why don't you give it, we've heard people when we've gone out and given groceries, give it to someone else who has more need. Well, we can do that, but we came here to give you this gift. You know, like, I, I, I say this because I recognize it in my own life. Sometimes I don't accept a gift or a compliment and just be gracious. My wife told me not too long ago, she said, and people tell me all the time when I'm in my uniform in public, thank you for your service, thank you for your service, thank you for your service. It happens all the time, nonstop, and I always say thank you. In my mind, I'm thinking, thank you for mentioning it or noting it, and she said, stop saying that. Just say you're welcome. And so I, it's hard because my response is, thank you for noticing. Thank you for saying that. But really, just you're welcome. You said thank you for your service. You're welcome for serving. You know, I, you know. So the, you have to be free to receive before you can be free to give. It isn't you who lives. It's Christ who lives in you and through you. This is a big one, and we're going to come back to this. The difference between 100 and 100,000 is only zeros. Same principles. If you have a lot or a little, same principles. Since, since money and power are two sides of this present world system, they both have the potential to exert corrupting influence on those who get close to them, which comes back to a scripture we just read. But I, and I say all those, and maybe, maybe something you know, triggered uh, inside of your soul when I read those, but we, they basically, a lot of these points boil down to three things that, uh, that we need in order to be generous and not bound by poverty. Um, and I say this because many of us in here have experienced poverty or a mindset of poverty and it's no fun life is no fun if you're impoverished um, the three things that i noticed when i read through all those and then the scriptures that we're reading here that we'll come back to we must not withhold everything for ourselves in acts chapter 5 ananias and sapphira sold land and in the deal I, I, don't, I, have, I didn't research all of this in detail to exactly how this happened and what the culture was like, but the, the, the environment at the time of the apostles teaching and um, establishing doctrine, people were going from house to house, sharing the things that they had. Uh, they were sending money to Jerusalem to take care of the, the church, the heart of the church. Um, they sold this land, and people were giving. People were, the Bible says they were laying down money at, prop, at the apostles' feet. And that, today, we've seen in, for years, we've seen people bring deeds and titles and gold and all kinds of stuff uh, to the apostles' feet. Um, we've seen it happen many times. But the thing that was unique, um, there's two things that were unique. One, 70 AD hadn't happened yet, so there were still in we were still in a mixture in between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. But Ananias and Sapphira came to the apostles saying they sold this land for a certain price, but they had already skimmed, well, let's just say 10%. I don't know if it was 10%, but skimmed a portion. And they kind of kept it to themselves. And they said, we sold this for $90,000. And th we're going to bless the kingdom of God and, and honor you, apostle, by giving you all this money. Because we made a lot of money off this and we are... Make sure you take note that Ananias and Sapphira are the ones that are giving this uh, and, and that take note of our sacrifice. When in reality, while they were at home, they had already put away 10 grand and said, we kind of need this. I mean, it's kind of, it's a lot of money. I mean, nobody's going to miss it, really. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of keep this for ourselves, and I think that'll take care of our needs. And then with what's left, after I take care of my needs, then I'll give 
to the kingdom, give to the apostles. And that offended the Holy Spirit. So they died immediately. Now, would that same thing happen today if we were dishonest and we kind of did a thing? I don't think so, because I think the old covenant is long gone, and I think we're under a new covenant, a better covenant according to Hebrews, and that's not the way God works. It's not, it's not, God's, it's not God's desire to strike us dead if we don't do something right. Um, but again, this was between Jesus' cross, resurrection, and the end of the whole priesthood in the old covenant. So we can't withhold something for ourselves. Every, everything we have is from God. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, 21, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 21, real quick. This is an, another subject, but I'm just going to read this verse. Verse 21 through 23 in 1 Corinthians 3. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. This, this is Paul telling the Corinthians, all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. And verse 23, and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So if we understand the way our wealth works, the first principle of all that is that it all belongs to God. So when I said that about Ananias and Sapphira, um, they didn't really recognize that. They thought they'll take care of themselves first, and then they'll let God have what, uh, what he wanted. And the thing is, they lied about it. They, if they would have come and said, you know what, we kept 10% because we have a need, we're going to give you 90%, whatever, they didn't say percentages in the Bible, but we'll give you 90%, maybe they would have stayed alive. Yeah, it, but they lied about it. They lied about it because they, were, they, were, they had this thing in their heart. So, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. So when we withhold for ourselves, it's like we're, we're afraid that God's not going to take care of us. When the Scripture makes it very clear, we, just, we sang about it many times this morning, everything we have is God's, and He gave us enough. He gave us everything we need, we believe that, that he gave us all things pertaining to life and godliness. So if we try to withhold, we're trying to make our own way and work it out. It, for me, this is the problem I have mentally. I, I think I got it calculated just right. Um, when in reality, we have to face life with God. It's all yours. Thank you for blessing me with the opportunity to steward resources. Thank you for giving me all things. Um, we just watched, some of us were here Wednesday night, we watched The Chosen and the, the wedding at Cana happened. Um, and several times in that show, they, before they took a drink of the wine, they said, blessed be the Lord our God, who has given us all the fruit of the vine, everything that we need. And so that when they would take a drink, it was like the first thing they started with was gratefulness, thankfulness. You gave us everything. And so when we take this drink of wine, we are acknowledging that first and thanking you for giving us everything that we have. So we we can have stuff. We can go on trips. We can go to Disney World. My, you know, I told you, Abigail went to Disney World yesterday. Um, we, can, we can do things, and we can be thankful, but it, none of it really means a whole lot if we don't acknowledge first that God gave us everything. And if we God gave us everything, he has enough to give us more than we need, and so we can be gracious to others. Um, the second thing, if we, we first, we can't withhold everything for ourselves. That just, it doesn't, the kingdom of God does not work that way. Um, two, we must recognize the value of others. This happens in a lot of ways. Um, and this is coming from those things that I mentioned uh, in, the, in those books. If we don't recognize the value of others, one, I already mentioned about how we can't receive compliments and we can't receive gifts. Uh, because we have to recognize that other people, even just sitting right here, the example of whatever, how many other people are sitting here right now, every one of us has gifts and talents, abilities, uh, maybe, maybe money, maybe resources, maybe raw talent in some area that we can use to benefit each other. If I think that I've got the, um, the best position intellectually with money, with physical health, with whatever, and I don't need y'all, then one, it's arrogant, it, it's foolish, and I, I'm probably asking for a, a problem in my near future to have to overcome. Um, but 
I completely belittle the value of everyone else sitting in here, and that's not the way Jesus sees people. That Jesus saw people, you have a value, and you have a value, and you have a value, and you have a value, uh, because he created you. He created Judy, and he created Jeff, and he created Isaac, he created Chloe, with value, like, like Brandy was saying this morning. And whenever, whenever we don't recognize the value of others, uh, maybe we focus on their, um, may, maybe we focus on the way they spend their money and cr- get critical, or maybe we focus on the thing they said that was really dumb, or maybe we focus on their social media posts. That's a bad one. That's, that's really bad. Because um, people say dumb things on, on, in, a <laughs> in a world where you can see it all. Um, but it, we may focus on th- things about them that, if the tables were turned, if a looking glass was pointed back at us, someone could look at us and be like, yeah, you do a good job covering it all up in public, but I see this thing in you that's pretty disgusting. You know, we don't, we don't look at it that way. We don't, well, I've got everything perfect. I don't. So we have to recognize even the person that does the dumb thing or the person that doesn't seem like they have it all together, they have value. Um, and sometimes we can add to that value even though uh, you, you could... Uh, twist the motive and, and say, well, I'm not going to sow into poor ground. I'm not going to sow into bad ground. And sometimes that's necessary. That's discernment. I mean, it could be spiritual discernment not to sow into poor ground. I mean, we have, how many people do we have at the end of a Sunday morning service have come in, hey, I want free money because you're a church and you have money and I want free money because I'm here. Uh, so I need gas from my car, or light, money from a light bill or groceries. Uh, and we hear this, lots of stories of why they came in at 1130 at the end of church and knew that we would be here. Um, it, that's just discernment, you know. So, uh, sometimes we're here like, sorry, don't have anything, and sometimes we're like, here, here's a g- gas card or whatever, or here, let me go fill up your tank. Um, the point is, we have to recognize the value in other people, and I'm completely okay with recognizing that the person is scheming us because they were at that church and that church and that church the last three weeks. I, it, we talk, we do, we, we do these things. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay with saying no. Uh, the answer is no. Um, the third thing that I see that was common between all these books um, was that we must be aware of the pitfalls of the worldly systems. So I'm going to go. I'm going to flip back to First Timothy six. I should have put my little bookmark there. If we have food and covering with these, we sh- with these we shall be content. For those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Um, There is a fine line between desiring to have money, more money in my bank account, a bigger house, a nicer car, opportunity to go on trips and vacations that I didn't have before, um, maybe money to be generous, just to be able to be generous, um, whatever the things are. Uh, sometimes the, having money to be generous can be so that you see your name on that plaque on the, ba- on the wall or that you can see your name in the paper because you're, or you're, you were the gold status or the platinum status hanging on the wall at the club or whatever the place is. Um, w- that we have to be cautious with our motives. That's what the scripture is very clear about here. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires will plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves many griefs. It says the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. It's not the money that's the problem. It's the pursuit of getting rich and having either the power or the fame, or the um, comfort. I mean, you get to a certain point where you're so comfortable, you're kind of lazy. I mean, I, I've, I've thought about it the way that America views retirement. I mean, retirement age is getting earlier and earlier and earlier, and people are getting, I mean, you, you can see it if you listen to any social media. Um, people are getting to 45 years old, and they've accomplished everything they wanted to accomplish, and they have the money they need, they can retire. But now what? What's the purpose of the rest of your life? It's not to just go yachting or go, you know, go drive an RV around the world. That gets old about about for about six months. And people, I've seen this over and over and over again. People realize that, oh, okay, I actually need to take, you know, there's family things I need to think about. There's community things. There's, oh, I'm going to actually turn 
70. I'll, I'll pick 70 as a fun number. And all my body parts and all my vision and all of my blood and cholesterol and all that stuff's not going to work the way it did when I was 40. And I'm going to need people and I'm going to need to slow down. And I'm, gonna, you know, it, there's all these things that affect you as you get older, and you realize, oh, I didn't have it all. I didn't. I thought I did, but I didn't have it all. So it's good to keep these things in mind when you're pursuing uh, every day at whatever age you are. Um, and and that's, that's why the scripture says we have to be cautious. Uh, so the third thing I said that blends a lot of these desires for uh, increase and in generosity is that we must be aware of pitfalls of worldly systems. Um, I did some fun research, and I will tell you in 1928, now give me some grace here on statistics and, and research, in 1928 people lived in houses Scarce indoor plumbing if you were outside the city. You probably didn't have outdoor, indoor plumbing if you were outside the city. The average person who had a normal job, like most of us in here, made 43 cents an hour, which is $856 a year. They paid $3 for a sweater at Sears, $15 for a suit at Sears, and about $1,000 for a new automobile. Now, this is a very... 1910s, the teens to the 30s were very huge growth for the automobile industry. So even the trades went from things that they were doing on the farm and food preparation and clothing and textiles to automobiles. And then everybody had to have an automobile. Um, at that time, $1,000 for an automobile, and some were $500, some were $1,500. If you, and some of the same brands of cars we buy today were the same brands then. Uh, I saw Chrysler and saw their names. I'm like, that's all the same stuff they sell today. Um, but there was about three people per horse in America in the, at the, around that time. I, I found different years. Um, whereas today, there are anywhere from 50 to 100 people per horse in the United States. Random, not, maybe not useful facts. <laughs> but but I, did, I just did a little bit of a, um, extrapolation on what these things would be worth today versus a salary that normal people uh, have. Um, and it really hasn't changed that much. The biggest, as I did the research, and this was just for, for, for fun and maybe for helping make the point, the, the only thing really that has changed is food and clothing have gone down in the cost significantly. So to get for a family of four or a family of six to have food and clothing, you pay less a uh, percentage of your income to have food and clothing. But you all know, if you do any kind of research on food, we've made food cheap. And it's missing some things that we need, and it has a lot of things we don't need in it. So you think, man, maybe we need to go back to where we escalate that food and clothing. And clothing is the same way. It's all made in China or Taiwan or, you know, whatever. And it's whatever. It, it, it used to be when you wore clothing, it represented something. It, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, if you were wearing a suit, you were wearing a dress, you were wearing whatever, it, the name meant something, the designer meant something, and it was, it was something to be proud of that you wore. Um, and some people didn't have anything to be proud of. They made their own clothes. I mean, it still happens today. Um, but now it's like you just go buy whatever wherever, and it doesn't mean anything. It's just clothes. You just put them on your body. So I'm not saying one way is right over the other. I'm just saying that our, our expenses as a family have gone down in food and clothing, but they've gone up in transportation. So we value. Uh, we don't have horses. We value that four-wheel vehicle sitting out there, and we put, we, we've made it today almost into a second home. I mean, those things are ridiculous. Uh, you can't, <laughs> you don't even, don't even know how to do half the stuff that you, when you get in a car. I, I buy used vehicles, but um, I could drive government vehicles that have some of those modern things, and it's hard to keep up with it. But the, the point is, in a hundred years, a lot of things haven't really changed that much. We, we, can, we can say we wish we could go back to the old days when we didn't have, um, maybe you didn't have as many issues with, nobody had air conditioning, that wasn't a thing. Um, didn't have, you know, it, for a while you had a, a phone on the table or on the wall, and when it rang, your neighbors and everybody else knew it was ringing, that you're, somebody was going to be talking, and everybody in the house wanted to know who was on that, that phone, who was on the other end of that phone, what did they want? E everybody, that, that was... That was normal. And if you, hear, if you go back far enough, it was only certain people that were authorized to pick up that phone. Only certain people. Because you've got a, your, your household being represented by this conversation that's going to happen between this phone, this phone and the other phone. 
today, six-year-olds have phones. <laughs> and you, you can dial them direct. And mom, parents have no idea who's talking to their six-year-old. Um, it, it's just a different world. And, and you have, everybody in the, in the house can be in their room on their phone watching something on their phone, you know, videos, talk, having a conversation, FaceTiming, whatever, and nobody has any idea what anybody's doing. Right? I mean, it, it's a different world. So I say that to say that some things haven't really changed. We can spend money, and a long time to say it, we can spend money on what we want to spend money on. It's just period. You're going to buy food. You're going to buy clothes. You're going to buy a house. Housing, by the way, I, you know, I did, was doing the research, hasn't changed that much. It's still 19 to 25 percent of your income that you put into housing and all the things that are required to have a house. That we have much bigger incomes now, but we have much bigger house prices and rental prices and, and utility prices. Um, you put money into what you want to put money into, and and this is I think this is the big thing for today. We can say it'd be great to live back then when there was not all these problems. And, and of course, there were diseases and things that we don't worry about today. Um, but we have so much more knowledge today, and we have passed that knowledge down to the lowest level. To where, like, just like, just like I said with the phone, our kids are learning things, and, and it, this is difficult to navigate. I'm not going to try to get political or make a statement because I don't, I don't know the answers. But... We used to think that in second grade you learn this thing, kindergarten, second grade, fourth, you learn these certain things at certain ages, and that's what's age appropriate. But in today's world, a lot of stuff we were spending time teaching kids, they don't need to know because they can look it up, or, they, or a computer does it for them. They don't have to know those same things. They st you know, we can all debate for hours probably on what kids should know in kindergarten, what they should know. Uh, I can tell you from Jennifer's experience, just the things she conveys to me, um, you need to learn how to share in kindergarten, you need to learn how to tell the truth, and you need to learn how to be able to sit still when you're told to sit still. Like, that's, that's great dividends for all of life. If you learn those things in kindergarten, then second grade is going to be great, <laughs> and fourth grade is going to be great. You know, it's, it, those are the basic, basic stuff. But because of the availability of information that we have and empowerment at a low level, then we have more responsibility to use what we have to do good things, to make the world turn. You know, and... It, People across the, United, across the world, regardless of religion, have a desire to make the world a better place. Well, as Christians, we know the Father of the one who created it all, and we want to make the world a better place. We, we believe that Jesus started this work, and he finished it, right? The, of, of his kingdom, of his government and power, there will be no end. And it just, his, his, his increase in power, his government over the whole world, his kingdom, continues to grow, and we get to be a part of it. You do not get to be a part of that by taking your one talent, like the scripture says, and going and burying it on the beach somewhere and just saving it for a rainy day whenever the, somebody comes back and wants to know how you've accounted for it. You, you get it by using it, spending it, giving it um, your, your talent. So uh, I hope that can be encouraging to you. Um, Matthew 22, one of, the, one of the authors I read mentioned in Matthew 22, there's three uh, passages. The first one is about the wedding feast and Jesus. I mean, Jesus is saying it, but they invite people to the wedding because the, the well-to-dos and the religious people were too busy and didn't have time, didn't think the wedding was a big deal. So they invited everybody, the regular people. And there was one person that came to that wedding that didn't have the right garments on. And, and the person holding the wedding uh, said, Psh, you're out. You, you're going to hell. I mean, it literally says that in the Bible. Uh, destruction. Um, this, and the second one, that I, th I think that passage is more about uh, coming in some other way. But he's also talking to the Pharisees about how they're going to get left behind. And then he goes into... Uh, the second part of Matthew 22, and they come and ask him. They're trying to trick him, and it says this in the scripture, Matthew 22. And they say, what if, um, should, should we give our money to Caesar? Because if you tell us we should give, our, they didn't say this part, but they're thinking, if you tell us we should give our money to Caesar, ah, we got you. You are not really from God. You know? And if you tell us to give all of our money to God, to the temple, then 
What are we supposed to do? We live in a Roman-occupied territory. We have to give money to Caesar. So you're wrong. And they, they thought they were going to trap him, and they thought they were slick. And, and Jesus says, well, look at the coin that you have in your hand. Whose image is on that coin? Well, Caesar. Well, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and give to God what's God's. You can't see that. You have to know it in your heart what's God's. And the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated that. As a matter of fact, they decided to put him to death. They did not like that be, because there was no rule book. There was no, there was no government of this. There was no uh, black and white lines that said, if you give 10%, then God will bless you. There was nothing like that, and they couldn't handle it because their traditions told them that they had this all figured out. All we got to do is obey the laws of Moses, all 613 precepts, and, and whoever doesn't do it, we'll condemn them and make them feel horrible, and they'll come bring, you know, guilt taxes, and they'll bring money, and the temple will do great. The priesthood will thrive, and the Jews will always be on top, even though we're never on top, because there was always somebody occupying their territory. That we, we're going we're gonna to get this, and may, maybe this Messiah that comes someday will set us all free from this misery that we're in. Um, and, of course, they couldn't see it. Right in front of their face was the Messiah that was coming to set them free. And it wasn't from a rule book. It wasn't, it wasn't from, you know, it was give to God what is God's. And another time he, and in, in the same passage, I think it's the next passage, actually. Um, no, it, it's later. But in the, the third passage in Matthew 22 is about marriage and the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And they said, hey, somebody, somebody dies got multiple uh, wives when he goes to be, you know, with the Lord. Uh, whose wife actually will she be? Um, or whatever. I, I, I got it backwards. But he says there's no marriage in heaven. Don't worry about that. And, and, he, and then in the, point, the point of the, of the message that he gave them, again, they were trying to trap him. They were trying to get him to say one way or the other. He says, don't worry about that. He says, when the scripture says, I am the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It doesn't say, I was the father. He says, I am the father. They're, they're living. So he's saying, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, or, yeah, Isaac still live today. That's basically what he's saying. Because they didn't die. And we know from Romans chapter 3 that Abraham did the things he did, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So something in that transaction made Abraham alive when he died. I, that's mysteries of God. I'll leave that for another day. But Jesus was telling him, don't worry about this tr trivial stuff that you're, try you're trying to pin down exactly the way it works so that you can build doctrine off of these mechanisms. It's not the mechanism that's important. It's, it's believing what you see uh, or maybe believing in something you don't see and, of course, he just shortly, just weeks later, died, resurrected. And now these Sadducees are faced with, oh, that is what he was talking about. And they had to choose. Do I, do I? And some Sadducees believed. Some, you know, some, some of all the people groups believed when Jesus died. And some of them didn't. Some of them kept trying to make reasons why this was not a good deal. So uh, my, my point today, when we think about, um, I'm going to read this one more time. Um, in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take nothing out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. We, we must learn to be content. And, and like I said, it, it says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And so that great gain can look like a lot of things. I don't, I don't think great gain means that you're going to be the person that owns half the square in Scottsburg. It could. It could mean that. But there's not only so many people that can own half the square in Scottsburg. I mean, there's, there's only a few halves. So. Um, but the great gain can be a lot of things. There's, I mean, I think when I think of Michael uh, coaching basketball, back, back in the day, that, you know, just 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, whatever it was, 
Um, you would have one person that would coach a team for many, many years. Fourth grade. I'm the fourth grade coach. It's, it's the same person every year. Fourth grade coach, fourth grade coach, fourth grade coach. And now it's like dad kind of travel with their, with their teams. But in the end, you've got a community of <clears throat> moms and dads that care about sports, care about their kids doing well in sports, and they're thinking about them. They see them when they skin their knee. They see them when they get mad. They, they are teaching competition, healthy competition. They're teaching strive for your goals, self, selflessness. Think about others besides just yourself. You can't do it by yourself. Your talent's not enough. I mean, all these things are going on on the basketball court or the baseball field or wherever, and people like Michael are contributing to that every day. So, again, value, great value. That's not what I'm doing. When I, I mean, I, my coaching abilities were over in about third grade. <laughs> and, I, and so and I'm, I was happy to see Ava play on the team this year and watch Eric Koppel go. As they, not me. So... Uh, there are other people that do other things that are of, of great value. Great gain can, can be those things. Um, it's, not, it's not just money. I think it's also safe to say that God will always give you enough. If we, we see a woman that came into the temple with two little pennies, two little mites, and gave them to the Lord, and Jesus said, hey, this woman gave everything. Those guys with their duffel bags of gold that they brought in because of all the religious requirements that require people to bring them golds, um, really wasn't much of a sacrifice. They did that for show, and they want everybody to see that they're bringing all those bags of gold into the temple. But that woman, she wasn't doing it for an audience, just God, just her Father in heaven. That's it. We, we have to see that in order for us to have the things that we need to have. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking about the sources of addiction. Uh, typically, it's typically uh, control, which is based out on fear, uh, mistrust because of pain in the past, trauma. Um, and I say this addiction because addiction is kind of the opposite of being content. If you're addicted to something, then you're not content. And w today our topic is contentment. And I believe as we look at the new year, 2024, um, for me, God, God is sharing with me, learn to be content in all the areas of your life, not, not just money, but be content to know that I've got you. And we, we sang about it today. I thought it was very great that I've got you, and all you need, turn to me. So when we're fasting this next week and a half, we, uh, we've already been there seven days, and we're fasting, the purpose is turn to the Lord, say, God, you're enough. What do you got for today? What, what's your will? What do, what's going on? How do I solve this problem? How do I stop doing this thing that I'm having a hard time, this habit I can't break? Or, you know, we always have our New Year's resolutions, and I'm not talking about resolutions because they fail after usually about three days. I'm talking about how, if I want to change my behavior in a certain area, how do I see something that's deeper that connects with who you are? Because you're eternal, and you're enough, and you're big. God, you, are, you, you, know, you created everything in the universe, so I know that you can easily steer me in the right direction with this thing that I'm dealing with. If relationship problem, you know, un unforgiveness, whatever. And so, God, I'm, I want to let go of what my brain and my body can comprehend, and I want to grab on to what you have. And I know that may not be logical, but I, I trust you, Lord, to give me the things that, that you need to give me. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And I pray that you're blessed this week. Next week, our brother Daryl is going to bring some great encouragement about giving and the things he's seen in his many years of, of life. Uh, Daryl's a giver. So, and I'll just, I'll just say that. that. That's his resume. He's a giver. Uh, just like Judy is a giver. Ju great giver. Uh, and so if you want to learn how to give, it would be great to listen, to hang out, go out to lunch. Take Daryl out to lunch. He probably wouldn't even argue with you. Maybe him and his wife both. Because he likes to be with his wife. So, you know, go listen. Hey, let's, let's talk about this. So, all right. Stand up.